a pluralistic world, is relativism the best response to religious truth? Yes. <laughs> Professor Lamp, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yes and no. <laughs> yes, but. Um, So if you look at religions in the long durée and you go way back in time, which is what historians do, um, you realize that um, you're, you're really looking at a time that is almost without time. That is, you're looking at things almost anthropologically that way. And there's a tendency for anthropology to um, perhaps to be um, used as a way of imagining a kind of a static thing. But I think, the, I think the models in general are really helpful, and I think they help us keep things into pers in perspective. And so if we look way back in time and we look at religions and we ask, so in a pluralistic world, is relativism the best response? Yes, but religions themselves were not really designed to be that open-minded. Um, one of the real points for religion early on as a, an expression of culture was to reify things in a culture that were otherwise man-made things. Nobody remembers when a culture began to think a certain way or do things a certain way or farm a certain way or um, make recipes a certain way or even talk a certain way. We've always talked that way and yet we know that that's not true. Over time, things change. Um, so if a particular culture imagines that the way that it does things is the way that things are to be done, that helps reinforce a kind of an in-group solidarity. And the problem is then when two cultures that both believe that equally, respective to their own situations and circumstances and, and cultural backgrounds, come together, um, there may be a potential for clash. Um, so that's one thing that's important to remember about this as a caveat to, yes, it would be nice to imagine a pluralistic world, but it requires quite a bit of work and in a short period of time because these religions coming into contact with one another in the way that they're coming into contact with one another now um, is something that's been happening relatively recently and going way back in time, uh, perhaps less so. Um, part of reinforcing in-group solidarity um, you can see in different traditions, sometimes we forget and we interpret things more pluralistically than they really were intended originally. For instance, you look at something like thou shalt not kill and you think, well, that's actually a universal principle that we could really latch onto. Except that in the context of thou shalt not kill in the Ten Commandments, it's clearly thou shalt not kill other Israelites. It certainly had nothing to do with the Philistines, the Midianites, or any of the other people that the Israelites completely slaughtered um, in their effort to claim their promised land. And they were told by their God that that's what they should do. That's a very specific historical context that's captured in a thing we call scripture and people will take it and try to explain it away and come up with different meanings. And I'm not really trying to get into any kind of biblical exegesis here, only that we have specific moments in time that capture a kind of a religion which is a, a closed system that doesn't really immediately suggest that it can be opened up and that it's going to have any relevance beyond that particular closed system unless we do some real uh, pulling out of context. So hence the newspaper, and every day we see it, this kind of us versus them, and now more than ever, it's, it seems to be in religious terms. I still, I'm old enough to remember reading Peter Berger when I was an undergraduate, and Peter Berger predicted that by now religion would pretty much just be a vestigial thing on the shelf and no one would care about it anymore. And I'm thinking, gee, did I pick the right profession, religious studies, maybe not. Um, he lived long enough happily to recant that view as he started to read the newspaper and realized, no, I think actually there might be a future in religious studies after all. So if there's no hope for any jobs in Yemen, for instance, or, or there's, no, there's no hope for justice for the Palestinians, then it's so easy to talk about U.S., the great Satan, um, and, and, and to turn that into, into, in, into, in a sense, into a kind of a religious dialogue. And on the other hand, Americans who find the world way too complicated and economics way too difficult to wrap themselves around find so much comfort in pro-life, anti-gay, having candidates who swear that they're evangelical Christians, um, Obama being unacceptably Muslim, even if he can prove that he was born in Hawaii. I mean, these are all religious issues that percolate now. And it reminds us that 
religion was such an easy thing in the past, going back to the Crusades and beyond, and all the Crusades before the Crusades that never had a name, where religion is such a convenient thing to grab onto and take complicated economic, political, social issues and, and just get people galvanized and moving and doing things that otherwise they wouldn't do. So then the question is really, does religion have to be a divisive force that way? And I bring us back to that kind of Pollyanna vision I have that maybe if we imagine all people as part of some uber culture, we can then come up with some sort of a universal religion for mankind that's going to work. I'm thinking though, the way that human beings work, that's gonna require an attack from a different planet altogether for us all to pull together and to do something like that because we have to have somebody that we hate and it would just be such a relief if finally it didn't have to be some other group of people and it could be, I don't know, somebody from a different planet but I guess cowboys and aliens didn't quite turn out the way that <laughs> Ron Howard expected. I like that bumper sticker, God bless all countries, no exceptions. I would say God bless all cultures, no exceptions. God bless all religions, no exceptions. And God, please tell people to stop using religion to perpetrate the kinds of disasters that people seem to like to perpetrate on people. All of that, um, with two minutes left, I've still got time. All of that then, <laughs> also with, with a respect for the fact that something is lost in that process of homogenizing the whole thing, of creating that uber culture, and that is the beauty of individual cultures. I mean, food alone, um, wouldn't it be boring if all the restaurants served the same thing, right? So we like that diversity. We think that that cultural diversity is a wonderful thing, and it really is in most of its cases. And so I wonder sometimes if by approaching things this way, imagining things from a psychological, sociological, anthropological perspective, musing about the possibility of some uber culture, uber religion, if we're getting away from then the things that make human beings so interesting, that makes it fun to travel, etc. Um, I might even be willing to give up some of that if I could get rid of some of the negative parts that I just described. But I'm, I'm sensitive to what Professor, Professor Lim is talking about in terms of the, the kind of the, the particular personal experience that people have of deity, it happens typically in a specific culture, at a specific time, and at a specific place. And for someone to come along from the outside, look at it from a social scientific perspective, and, and kind of steamroll the whole thing, or put it into little categories, or say that you've just got certain neurons that are bouncing in a particular direction, and that's why mm -hmm. I, that's, that's, a, that's an, an, a borderline offensive kind of a thing. Um, so. There's, there's a baby and there's bathwater here, and I'm just mm -hmm. not sure exactly how to, how to salvage the good part if we're going to do something about the, about the murky water. Hmm. Thank you, Professor Wolf. Professor Lim, in a pluralistic world, is relativism the best response to religious truth? Well, before I answer that, I think that was a very, very helpful answer, and I came to this place thinking that it'll be sort of a pugilistic endeavor, it has turned out to be a lot more amicable, perhaps to the chagrin of some audience who are expecting a good fight or something like that. Maybe, maybe there will be time for Q&A and we have a good referee in the middle and we can respond to each other's points. And, but I just found this very, very interesting and illuminating conversation. Is relativism the only way or the best response to religious truth? Um, not necessarily, although I can understand, completely understand the impulse for it. I mean, as I studied the early modern and early enlightenment period, as a result of the 1648 kind of Treaty of Westphalia, as a result at the conclusion of the Thirty Years' War, but even before that, you know, you got the Protestant and Catholic Reformations that basically erupts and splints asunder the Western kind of Christendom. Even before that, you got various nameable and unnameable crusades and genocidal attempts all in the name of God. So we come right back to Bob Dylan's song, you know, in the name of God, you can do almost anything. It, it empowers you, it kind of enables you to do something that would be otherwise impossible, right? So I think there is that explosive potential because it can either make us, religions can either make us beautiful or bestial or something in between. And more often than not, we find that middle ground to be the obtainable reality for many of us. But I'd like to underscore the fact that if relativism is just quashing out all the particularities so that we can, oh, let's just get along, it doesn't really matter, we all believe the same thing anyway, don't we? And oftentimes the answer is not necessarily. So I think what I would like to challenge by way of saying no to this uh, rel uh, relatives and the best response to religious truth is you are at some of the best colleges in the country. Uh, I didn't have the privilege of going to the Claremont College Consortium. 
I didn't really know much about that, having grown up in Philadelphia. Because all the names really confused me. I said, oh, why bother? You know, <laughs> which one is which? And I couldn't figure out which one. And there's a whole thing called Claremont College Consortium. But then Claremont McKenna, there's Pitzer, there's Scripps, there's Pomona, there's Harvey Mudd. Have I gotten everybody? All right, okay. Well, so, <laughs> no applause. Huh? All right, so please stand the crowd. <laughs> right, no, I'm just kidding. So, but you, you see, you are at, you, you have, you possess some of the, best and the brightest minds, why not tackle this head on with spirit of compassion and charity and desire to learn about the other, but also desire to learn more about the traditions that you come from, while recognizing we may differ, while acknowledging that we are actually trying to get at this something meaningful, something that gives our quotidian reality, imbues that or baptizes it with some other you know, kind of ennobling aspirations, giving us a kind of greater ambition or the compass for meaning, pursuit of meaning in our kind of humdrum existence. I do think that relativism, rather than particularly making these religious traditions more beautiful, um, makes kind of stultifies conversation. To me, colleges and universities is the last place, the last bastion, as I know it, here in, in our global village, where conversations of this sort can take place, right? Conversations about the ultimate thing of our human existence. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.